Hello and welcome to Living Truth, a media ministry of the People's Church. Wherever you're tuning in from, we're thrilled that you've decided to join us for our time of worship and teaching as we grow in God's Word together. This week in our special guest teaching series, we're so blessed to hear from our friend Peter Chu as he shares what God has put on his heart for our community. Let's listen together. Good morning. It's good to be with you again. As you turn to John 11, let me give you three pieces of context or background. First, the book of John has 21 chapters, and John divides it into two halves. Chapters 1 to 11, 12 to 21. Each half, interestingly, climaxes with the death, burial, and resurrection of somebody. In John chapter 11, it's Lazarus. In John chapter 20, it's Jesus. John writes his gospel to answer the question, who is Jesus? In the first 11 chapters, that question is answered by John quoting the I am statements that Jesus makes. He makes seven of them. Statements such as, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. And as Andrew took us last week, I am the good shepherd. Today, we will hear, I am the resurrection and the life. Along with the seven I am statements, John includes seven signs. Out of all the miracles that Jesus did, he chose seven. The second bit of background is Jesus and healing. He heals at the scene, he heals from a distance, and at this point in time, he's already brought back to life two people, both of them children, the son of the widow of Nain and the daughter of Jairus. But notice, both of these children were dead, but not yet buried. Lazarus is a whole other story. Lastly, John 11 itself. If you are looking at this chapter on your own or in your small group in the coming weeks, I would encourage you to pay attention to words that are repeated in the chapter, words such as sick and dead, the word love, and John's favorite word, the word believe. John chapter 11 has 57 verses. It is the longest description of a miracle by Jesus. Most take 15 verses or less. Why is this one so long? When you read the chapter, you realize the miracle itself is covered in two short verses. What are the other 55 verses? And when you look at the chapter, you realize it's all talking, 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 talking. You look at the dialogue and you realize it's all centered around Jesus. Jesus talks to all the characters in the chapter in turn. And when you follow the dialogue, you realize that John chapter 11 can be outlined like a wagon wheel. Jesus is at the center of the chapter, and as you move through the chapter, he talks to all these individuals in turn. He talks to us, the reader, the disciples, Martha, Mary. That's how the chapter is structured by John. It's structured as a wagon wheel with Jesus at the center, and he takes us through all the conversations that he has with the people in the story. Let's dive into the story. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Lazarus is introduced, but the introduction is a little unusual. We're given his name, and usually we would get his name, his family relationships, the son of, brother of, and then where he's from, Bethany. But in this case, right after his name, we're told he's sick. 
That sickness is what defines his character for the entire chapter. Being sick, the sisters send word to Jesus. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Lord, a title to address someone in authority. But in this case, the sisters are also acknowledging their dependence on Jesus' resources. The one you love. That's an unusual way to identify someone. They don't identify Lazarus by name. They don't even say our brother. They are appealing to Jesus on the basis of his relationship to Lazarus. The one you love. Because he's so close to the family, what the sisters are really saying is, the one you love like a brother is sick. very cryptic message. There is no request placed on Jesus. Did the sisters have unspoken expectations? We'll find out. But as the readers, what are we expecting Jesus to do? Because we could be Lazarus. I'm sick. You love me. What are you going to do? We don't have to wait long. John tells us what Jesus' response is. This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Jesus' response is divided by John into three parts. The first is, what does Jesus say? What does he feel? And what does he do? What does he say? He makes two pronouncements. The first is a prediction. This sickness will not end in death. Well, that's kind of a strange response. You would expect him to say, well, don't worry, he'll get better. Or let's go visit him. We'll heal him. Why does Jesus even mention the possibility of death? Because he is providing a spoiler. Hey, As the reader, relax, he's not going to die. He's telling us the ending. That only serves to raise other questions, which is, well, what is going to happen to Lazarus? If he's not going to die, what's going to happen? And Jesus, why do you need to reassure me that he's not going to die? The second pronouncement is the purpose for why Lazarus is sick. It is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. What does it mean for God to be glorified? When he is revealed as he truly and fully is. In this setting, we have to rethink our assumptions. We think that only success and accomplishments glorify God. But Jesus here is saying, Lazarus's sickness will glorify God. How can sickness, failure, weakness glorify God? That's God's responsibility. Our responsibility is to trust and obey. The second response of Jesus is described by John, his affection for the family. Jesus loved Mary, her sister, and Lazarus. He names each sibling in turn to emphasize he really loved this family. The last part of Jesus' response is his action. So, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Are you telling me Jesus waited intentionally for Lazarus to die? But I thought he loved him. The sisters tell us he loves him. John tells us he loves him. He waited for him to die? Yeah, that's what the story is saying. He waited those two days for Lazarus to die. Well, then Jesus, how does, what about your prediction about him not dying? And it's, the story is not going to end in death. How can this bring glory to you if you let him die? And I thought, I thought you loved him, Jesus. 
It's landing very close to home. Jesus, are you going to wait for me to die? The story moves on. Jesus finally arrives in Bethany. He waited two days. It took two days for him to get there. Now we're told that Lazarus has been buried and in the tomb for four days. Now, four days is significant because at that time, there was a common belief that the soul hovered over or near the body for three days, after which it would depart, and there would be no hope of resuscitation. So Lazarus being dead four days before Jesus shows up eliminates any controversy of what will happen next. This was a miracle of resurrection, not a resuscitation. Four days also means that Lazarus is not just dead, he's decomposing. So he's not cold, he's actually squishy and smelly. Okay. The reader wants to get on with the action, but now Jesus talks to Martha. Martha says, Lord, in her grief, she still acknowledges who Jesus is. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Notice that Lazarus is no longer the one you love, Jesus. He is now her brother. There's a separation and a distance now. Jesus, you didn't show up. My brother died. She also connects Jesus' absence with Lazarus' death. Your absence resulted in him dying. She feels the disappointment of unmet expectations. Jesus knew, Jesus was late, Jesus had the power, he chose not to do anything. Recognize the tension that is in Martha's statement. If you had been here, she has faith that Jesus has the power to alter the outcome. She has faith. My brother would not have died. She also has disappointment. I love Martha's honesty. I believe you are Jesus, but at the same time, I am so disappointed. We often hold both in it together, but we lack the honesty to admit it. We're afraid to tell God, I'm disappointed in you. And Martha models what's what we get in the lament psalms over and over again. God, I know you are God, but I am so disappointed in you. You have not shown up. But Martha tells us we can hold the two in tension. You are my God, but I'm really disappointed. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. This is actually very similar to her message. She defers to Jesus. She does not explicitly request, can you restore him to life now that you've finally shown up? Jesus does not answer her directly. He looks to the future. Your brother will rise again. And Martha says, yes, I know he will rise in the last day. And then Jesus turns Martha's eyes and her faith from her brother, from the future, to himself and the present, and he declares to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection and the life that you are looking forward to for your brother, I am the basis for it. Do you believe this? Martha then makes the most profound and comprehensive answer to who Jesus is. You are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. The dialogue stops. The next person Jesus talks to is Mary. Mary opens with the exact same question that Martha has. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. John uses each character to voice the elephant in the room question. If Jesus loved him, why did he let him die? Interestingly, Jesus does not say anything to Mary. He simply joins her in her grief. We move on. In the next verses, I see this as an internal dialogue Jesus is having with himself. 
When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. John uses three very strong emotive words to describe the depth of Jesus' emotional response. He was deeply moved, he was troubled, and he wept. Being fully God and fully man, the Son of God who has come into the world, Jesus empathized with our experience. A lot has been written about the cause of Jesus' grief and his emotional response, and John doesn't give any explicit clues. He leaves it for the reader to contemplate. John moves on. Jesus next speaks to the crowd. They're finally at the tomb, and the crowd has two opinions. See how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? John uses the crowd to voice the elephant in the room question. If he loved Lazarus and he had the power, why did he let him die? We're told three times. The sisters tell us Jesus loved Lazarus. John tells us, and now the crowd tells us. John keeps putting that question into the face of the reader, us. At the tomb, we're reminded that Lazarus is not just dead, he's decomposing. Jesus is not just bringing someone back from the dead, he's bringing a decomposing body from the dead. And if you think about it, that will be our resurrection. We won't just be cold dead, we'll be beyond decomposition. We'll be dust and dirt. And it is the dust and dirt that he resurrects back into new life. Martha has her concerns. Wait, wait, Jesus, don't, don't open the tomb. It's gonna really stink. This is the same Martha that just said, you are the Christ, the son of God who has come into the world. She may know who Jesus is, but she doesn't fully comprehend the power that he has she is going to get a greater glimpse of a never-changing God. Jesus didn't get right to the miracle, though. There's one other person he's going to talk to. He's going to talk to his father. His audible prayer is for the benefit of the gathered crowd. It will answer the question, who is Jesus? He's been sent by God with God's power and authority and he's in constant communion with God. The prayer followed by the miracle will validate what he says. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the Christ. I am the Son of God, and I have come into this world. The last person Jesus talks to is Lazarus. He calls Lazarus by name. He has to specify Lazarus or everyone's gonna come out, okay? Lazarus, come out. He speaks a word of command, just like creation. Let there be, and it was so. The power of the spoken divine word, it happens. Lazarus comes out. Interestingly, as we referenced before, the miracle is covered in two short verses. You're thinking, well, that's kind of anticlimactic. You were expecting, well, where's the thunder? Where's the lightning? Where's the earthquake? He, Lazarus come out, he comes out. That is John's point. It is anticlimactic because raising Lazarus from the dead is no big deal for Jesus. The big deal is not the miracle. It's the Messiah behind the miracle. What can we take home from the story? Well, let's start with the elephant in the room question. If Jesus loved Lazarus, why did he let him die? If Jesus loves me, why do bad things happen to me? Now let's land it even closer. If, Jesus lo if God loves Jesus, why did he send him to die? If God loves Jesus, 
why did he send them to die? First, we have to disconnect God's love from our circumstances. We make the mistake of creating a cause and effect relationship between our circumstances and God's love. If things are going well, God loves me. If things are not going well, God does not love me. He's abandoned me. The Bible's big idea is that God loves us, period. An absolute statement. No conditions, no exceptions, no qualifiers, no fine print. Jesus is telling Lazarus and his sisters, I love Lazarus. Whether he's sick or healthy, dead or alive, I love him, period. Faith is the ability to uncouple God's love from our circumstances. Faith is the ability to uncouple God's love from our circumstances. You've heard me say before, faith is not a noun. It's not something you have. Faith is a verb because it is a choice that we make. We make the choice that no matter what is going on in our life, God loves us. The second answer to how God and Jesus can love us but make us go through a dark valley is that death is not the end for the believer. It is the beginning of life as God intended in Genesis 2. Death waits for all of us. What we try to control is how and when. Not yet and not this way. But for the believer, death is a gift from God. It is a release from this life and an entrance to the life he intended for us to have from the beginning. And because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, God has made an ironic reversal of circumstances to what death is. Death leads to life. It is not the end. And that's why Paul says, death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? Death has been vanquished. Third, Jesus has the t-shirt. By that I mean, he's been there, he's done that, he has the t-shirt. Because he has gone through everything that we're gonna go through. He was born, he lived, he died, he was resurrected, and he is now in glory. Everything that awaits us, he's gone through. He understands what we're going through. Fourth, it's not about us, it is all about God. His priority is not our happiness. His priority is that he be known as the Lord of the universe. In John 11, for that to happen, he wanted Jesus to raise someone from the dead. Well, for Jesus to raise someone from the dead, someone has to volunteer to die. Lazarus was voluntold, not really volunteered. But someone had to die for Jesus to raise someone from the dead, and it was Lazarus. Which brings me to my last point. Are we willing to live like Lazarus? Am I willing to be used as an object lesson by God so that others will know that he is God? Do you think Lazarus lived differently after Jesus brought him back to life? I would like to think so. If we were given a do-over, how would we do things differently? And the reality is, every believer is a Lazarus. We've all been given a do-over. We were dead in sin, we have life in Christ because he is the resurrection of the life. How are we living this new life? What are we living for? Our glory or God's glory? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love that nothing can separate us from. We pray that with every breath that we are able, we would sing of your goodness and that we would give people a greater glimpse of your greatness.
great love and your never changing character. Amen. You were the word at the beginning. One with God at the Lord most high. Your hidden glory Death cannot hold our God. I think a grave could not overcome him. So I want us to lift our voices today and sing. That death could not hold you. The veil torn before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. Come on. The heavens are roaring. The praise of you. Yes, God, you are the wonderful, powerful, beautiful name of Jesus. And we believe that it is in your name that transformation happens. We're so blessed to worship and learn with you. If you're feeling led to support or learn more about our ministry, visit us online at livingtruth.ca. You can also call the number on your screen to donate. Thanks for joining us today. We're looking forward to worshiping with you again soon.